and then we'll have Sarah Schwett with uh, a short Q&A session. Um, well, thank you everybody for coming. And um, so I'm going to be talking today, as you can see, about gender equality in South Africa. And um, this was something that I first, I guess, got interested in. I studied abroad in Cape Town, South Africa, this time last year, last spring. And um, then in the fall, this past semester, I took my political science senior seminar with Professor Horning, who's back there. Um, and my final research paper was about gender equality in South Africa for that class. And so um, after that, I think my interest has actually just taken off even more, and I'm now starting my senior thesis for political science. And for that thesis, I'm comparing gender equality in South Africa to gender equality in the United States. But um, today, I am just gonna give you guys a little snippet, kind of go through some of the history of gender equality in South Africa. And um, I think South Africa really is an interesting case because you know, it started as a democracy in 1994, which is very recent. And at that time, a lot of more progressive values like gender equality were becoming normalized. And so I think South Africa is a great country to look at to see if in a recent democracy, will they then incorporate those values like gender equality, or is it still something that's difficult to do? So um, let's get started. First, I just want to give you a little bit of context on South Africa. So up here, you can see that I have um, a map of the continent of Africa with um, South Africa framed there in the little red box. And so here we have um, the, Nas the um, Nationalist Party. And so this was the party that was in control of South Africa, like the white, um, originally from Dutch colonizers party. And so we're going to start in 1948. So here we see Prime Minister D.F. Milan in the middle. And he was the guy who basically, um, his government put apartheid in place. They started apartheid in 1948. And apartheid, for those of you who aren't very familiar with it, means separateness in Afrikaans, which is the language derived from Dutch that they use in South Africa. And it was basically a policy that institutionalized racism in South Africa and kept white people in control. So it did this through um, systematically categorizing people according to their race, so if you weren't white, you had to carry around a passbook, and it said what your race was, and then that also dictated where you could be and what you could do. You couldn't be in certain neighborhoods. Um, marriage was banned in, uh, between races. So there are a number of different laws that really did just institutionalize this racism. Um, and in that way, the minority population in South Africa of 4.5 million white people was able to keep the majority population of 19 million black people under control. So I bring this up basically just to kind of give you a backdrop for what was going on in South Africa in the 20th century, and I think it's also even more important for what then came next, which was the liberation movement. So moving into the liberation movement, or actually kind of fast forwarding to the resolution, um, I want to go to 1996, which was when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission started. So the TRC, as it's known, um, was pretty famous form of transitional justice. It was this way of trying to resolve apartheid and the horrible human rights violations that happened during apartheid. Um, you can see here this guy, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who's pretty well known, um, was one of the leaders of the TRC. And so basically the TRC had operated for um, two years, from 1996 to 1998, and it was looking at human, human rights violations during apartheid from 1960 to 1993. Um, so just to give you guys a sense of sort of how it worked, I have a short, we're just going to watch like a little snippet of this video. Um, so this was from a famous murder during apartheid. It was called the Craddock Four, these four black men who were murdered by white men. And so during the TRC, basically what happened were the perpetrators and the victims came together. And they were supposed to be having this conversation and talking about the crimes, trying to offer forgiveness, trying to kind of move on basically. So just so you can see what it was like, I'm just going to show this little news. On the night of June 27th, from Rendsburg, who passed the execution order down from Harold Sneeman to the men who would carry it out. This week, there was more detail from Eric Taylor and Gerhard Lotz, who, together with Saki van Sale, stopped their victims on the road from Port Elizabeth to Craddock and took them to deserted sand yeah, dunes, where... Knives? I know that... The persons were then set alight, and the evidence which I have heard regarding what happened, I cannot remember. 
I think it happened. I think. Okay, so if you want to, you know, learn more about the TRC, you can find a lot of these videos online. But I just wanted to show kind of what it looked like in person. Um, so, you know, you see in this situation, in most of the testimonies during the TRC, the victims or the victims' families were there with the perpetrators, and they were starting to have this conversation and this dialogue. Um, but what came out, and how a woman come into this, is that five weeks into the TRC, there was a study done that revealed that of the 204 testimonies that had been heard that, thus far, 75% of women's testimonies were centered around men. So these women were coming to the TRC, and they were supposedly speaking about these atrocities that they saw during apartheid, but really they were talking about the atrocities that men in their lives suffered and not the atrocities that they suffered. So whether it was like their husbands or their sons, once again, women were kind of being put on the back burner and not really getting their own voice. So as a result, um, they created these special women's hearings that lasted for two days, from July 28th to the 29th in 1997. And I have here a quote um, from one woman who spoke about a rape during apartheid. And so she said, um, but this guy, after raping me, he disappeared a bit. Um, then my boyfriend, this is a disgrace. We should not talk about this because people will look at him in such disgrace that his girlfriend had been raped. So the only time I started relating it openly, that's when after I spoke to the Truth Commission, and it's then that I related this to my mother, that I had been raped. So basically during apartheid, she was never able to come forth and say that she had been raped, and it wasn't until the woman's hearings that she was able to finally tell the story. So it was great in a lot of ways. She got to come out and finally kind of, you know, come clean about this horrible um, experience that she had. But um, what you don't really see here is that, you know, she got to say this, but at the same time, the story, when I read more about it, so this woman, Ketaboni Dube, was raped. Um, her rapist was never arrested. She contracted syphilis from her rapist and was then not be able, was, was not able to have kids. And then her boyfriend, this is what comes out in this quote, her boyfriend then abandoned her because there was this disgrace that she had been raped. So you see that women are completely victimized during apartheid, but then what happened in the women's hearings were that men weren't invited. So you see this quote, but the only people who heard this quote were the other women who were in the room. So this kind of underlined the issue that not only was she unable to actually, as a victim, she wasn't able to confront her perpetrator in the way that many men were during the TRC, but then nothing was really done about it either because during the TRC, rape was not classified as a political crime. So they couldn't even bring the perpetrator in to have her say, you committed this crime against me and talk to him about it and feel any sort of justice or any sort of reconciliation. So I think this kind of underlines a theme in South African society that continues up to today that women in many ways play the subordinate role and their voices were not heard by men. But now backtracking and going, um, looking into the liberation movement, it's not to say that there wasn't anything that happened for women during this time. So in order to end apartheid and during the liberation struggle, many women actually came together from civil society and were able to form these groups that started to advance gender equality. So the first example that we see of this was in 1954 with FEDSA, the Federation of South African Women. And so they began by actually protesting the pass laws, which is one of the apartheid laws I talked about before, how you had to carry the passbook around and um, people would, and then they could check your race. And so they started by protesting the pass laws, that's what this picture is from, but then they eventually segued into um, protesting or trying to end violence against women. So that was one, like, one of the first women's groups that started during the liberation struggle. Then we had the Black Women's Federation now in 1983. And so both of these two groups actually took on a little bit more of a militant tone towards the government, um, but they were trying to really link the cause of racial justice with gender equality moving forward in the liberation movement. So we see the beginnings of civil society really coming out and forming to um, work for different causes and you know, racial equality and then also gender equality. And one of the most significant and um, well-known groups was the ANC that came out of the liberation struggle. So the African National Congress, this is a political party that is still in control in South Africa today. Um, most people know it best by Nelson Mandela, its original president. Um, so when the ANC was founded in 1912, they originally did not include women. And so the Bantu Women's League started to kind of parallel the ANC's work, but just for women. And it wasn't until 1943 that the ANC finally said, okay, it's time. And they let women in, but in this sort of subgroup where they created the ANC's Women League. So the ANC's Women League, though, was very effective. And they actually started this um, group called the Women's National Coalition. 
And so this started in 1991, 1992, so it was all around the time that the ANC was really gearing up and making their demands for liberation and for democracy around when the new constitution was written in 1994. But the women during that process, they came together over this common mission because they realized that they were being excluded. Um, they weren't originally invited to the Convention for a Democratic South Africa, so they weren't a part of writing this new constitution originally. So women from different parties and from different races, so across ethnic um, boundaries, came together to form the Women's National Coalition and to start to try to create like real change and influence the constitution as, as democracy was taking off in South Africa and they were creating this new state. So it was pretty unprecedented at the time because as you can tell from apartheid, you know, divisions were just concrete during apartheid. That was the point of apartheid. So to come across different parties, to come across different races, was pretty great and an unprecedented thing. So I have a picture here also of some of the women from the Women's National Coalition at a march. So you can see that they're all different races and they're representing different parties as well. So one of the most noteworthy things that um, the women, the, the WNC did was create this woman's charter that was in many ways supposed to mirror the freedom charter that the ANC wrote around um, when the new constitution was written in 1994. So the Women's Charter, first and foremost, they wrote this constitutional equality clause that was, again, unprecedented for the time because it was one of the most strong anti-discrimination clauses in a constitution to date. So the women demanded that they wanted, you know, among other things, they wanted shared responsibility and decision-making in the home and effective equality in politics, the law, and in the economy. So they set that tenant. Um, and then they tried to you know, get some things into practice. So one of the other really noteworthy things that they did was they created this gender quota. And this is something we're gonna talk a little bit more about in a minute. But they said that when, in 1994 originally, when they first started democracy, they set a quota of one third of women in parliament. So they wanted one third of the seats in parla parliament to be filled by women. Um, and that was very up and coming at the time. As you guys probably know, we don't have that in the United States to this day. They also created a few different institutions for gender equality, so like the Commission on Gender Equality, which was supposed to just check any sort of um, gender relations in and outside of government. And they also created the Office on the Status of Women, which was supposed to act as like a liaison between NGOs working for women's rights and the president and parliament. And then Jacob Zuma, who is the current president of South Africa, Africa he then furthered this in uh, May of 2014 and he created the Ministry for Women to just bring more light to women's causes. So you can see that in many ways, the WNC really did institutionalize gender equality on a state level in South Africa. Um, so to look a little bit deeper into that, I, wanted, I just wanted to put this up here so you guys could get an overview of the South African government and how it works. In a lot of ways, it's pretty similar to the US government. Um, just as we have uh, the legislator, the executive, and the judiciary, they have the same thing. Um, one difference, though, is that in their legislative body, they have a national assembly and a national council of provinces, whereas we have the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, so here's actually some pictures. On the top, you have the national assembly, and then on the bottom, the national council of provinces. So before 1994, um, in those houses and in the legislature, there were only 2.7 percent of uh, only 2.7 percent of parliament was made up of women before 1994 and before democracy started. But in 1994, when they put that gender quota in place, the number skyrocketed and it went up to 26.5 percent women. Now today, in 2016, it's around 42 percent, which you can see in this chart. So you can see here that South Africa is not number one. Rwanda actually is number one for having women in parliament but it's number 10. Notably, the United States is not on this list. <laughs> so as I've said, um, the women's groups in South Africa and the South African government generally has undeniably brought more women in. There are more female representatives in government now and they have institutionalized gender equality in many ways. But at the same time, even though they have this gender equality in theory, or they should have great gender equality in practice, we're not really seeing that. Um, so at this time, I wanna ask, just because this was something that struck me when I was doing my research, how many of you have heard of um, the Office on the Status of Women in your own towns, even in the United States? Have you ever heard of that existing in your city? No. Yeah, so 
so I hadn't either. And so when I was researching originally the Office on the Status of Women in South Africa, I Googled that just to find out more about it in South Africa. First of all, almost nothing came up, so I was kind of struck by that. But what did come up on my Google search was that there was an Office on the Status of Women in San Francisco, which is where I'm from. And I was struck that that even existed. And I'd never heard of it, never heard of anything that they had done. And I kind of had this revelation in that moment where I said, wait a second, how much do all these bureaucratic institutions actually, actually help for gender equality? Because at a certain point, I don't think that they're really doing all that much. So I looked into that a little bit more, and in South Africa, that is, that is quite a problem. So one thing right now in South Africa, even though there are these women in government, is that they lack authority. So staff in the government departments that are supposed to be concerned with gender equality, they never rise above the level of deputy director, which means that they can't formulate any policy, and they also cannot critically review any policy. So they're there, but in a lot of ways, they're just figureheads. Like, you can see them, they're present, they're representative, but then they're not actually passing any like gender equality content. Um, additionally, when women did come into government in 1994, most of those women were coming from pretty privileged, affluent backgrounds. So they came in and they created these gender issues uh, that they thought were some of the big priorities for advancing gender equality, but really they ended up being more strategic goals than they were practical. Like they came in and they said, okay, these two big, two big gender issues that they wanted to tackle were um, criminalizing or at least decreasing pornography in South Africa and then also legalizing abortion. And it's not to say that that's not you know, worth working on, but there are plenty of poor South African women in the country at that time who said, well, we want, we want better uh, healthcare. We want access to clean water. We want education. We want job opportunities. Um, and so these elite women in government weren't really tackling some of those very practical issues. Additionally, because there isn't any um, actual women's party in parliament, even though the women are involved there and they're, they're representative, half the time they end up just prioritizing um, whatever their party is working on. So whatever the, app, the ANC is working on. Or in the case of Patricia DeLille, who is a um, parliamentarian from the Pan-Africanist Congress, which is one of the other big parties in parliament, she had a quote where she said, I am an African before I am a woman. So I think what that shows is that oftentimes these female policymakers are having women's issues take a back, beyond the back, take a back seat. And so they're really trying to advance whatever the agenda of their party is. And because there's no specific women's party, usually those aren't women's issues or a woman's agenda. Lastly, also in 1994, when these women started getting involved in government, Part of the problem was that there was so much feminist brain power in a lot of these civil society organizations that I talked about earlier, like the WNC and some of those groups that formed during the liberation struggle. So then they all flocked to government and there's this influx of women coming into government, but it took a lot of like the most, most um, commanding and most powerful women out of civil society and brought them into the system and government where they really couldn't do anything. Because like, like I just described, for the most part, in the South African state, their hands are kind of tied. Like they can't actually accomplish that much. Um, so you see that there is, even though there is gender equality in theory, there are definitely some problems right now with its execution. Um, I, do, I don't want to overlook some of the progress that has been made. Um, for instance, there has been the Termination of Pregnancy Act, which legalized abortion, the Domestic Violence Act, which criminalized violence against women. So it's not to say that there hasn't been any progress, um, but nonetheless, there are some very real blaring problems towards women in South African society today. I think the most well-known problem is violence against women. So in South Africa, one in three women will be raped in her lifetime, and one in four women will be beaten by her domestic partner. So that in and of itself is a huge problem, but additionally, when you then look at the economy, you see that women still are not achieving equality in the economic sector. So in the workplace, um, women are not yet equals. They're underrepresented in senior management positions, and they're instead really heavily represented in service and sales. Um, the earned income of women last year was $9,972, and for men it was $16,230. So in other words, that means that women are making 61% of what men make. So just to kind of revisit my overall point, in South Africa, they definitely do have the structure for gender equality. They, they've set that up in the country pretty well, but there are just these flaws in its execution. So trying to be an optimist and looking um, you know, forward to some solutions and what does this mean, 
I think from my research that one of the most effective ways to further gender equality would be to have a stronger partnership between civil society and some of those women's organizations and NGOs and government. Because historically, that's where we have seen a lot of progress. Um, just a few examples. In 1995, some NGOs working on women's rights and the Department of Welfare organized a conference in Cape Town, um, which produced the National Network on Violence Against Women. After that, in 1996, there was a parliament and NGO task force that uh, dealt with violence against women, and they made the Departments of Justice and Safety and Security all declare uh, violence against women a priority crime. Additionally, in 1995, two committees in parliament and two NGOs created um, both the, women's, uh, the South African Women's Budget Institute, which calculates the impact on government spending on women, and then also the Gender Education and Training Network, which um, works to strengthen those ties between civil society and government and really implementing effective strategies to help gender equality. So to move into my conclusion, um, I have a picture here. This is from the last month, actually, on the streets in South Africa. Uh, this was just a whole bunch of South African citizens who came out to protest Jacob Zuma, the current president, because they want him to resign. Um, so while that's a different issue, it's not gender equality, I guess I thought this picture was important because it does illustrate that South African citizens know how to mobilize. Civil society can come out, but it's more about channeling some of that energy into gender equality and working on that cause. Um, but I really do think that South Africa is an interesting, like I said in the beginning, it's an interesting case to study um, and one that the United States can learn a lot of lessons from because they have set up this infrastructure in government where women could be equally represented and um, have gender equality be institutionalized in the state. Yet the flaws and the deficiencies that they still show prove that you need this two-pronged approach. You need to have civil society and you need to have government working together in order to enact real results. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there are any questions, if I should like Okay, maybe a few questions if there are any. So the gender quota has changed because it started in 1994, it started and it was just one third of seats in parliament were supposed to be for women. And now ideally they want to have 50%, it's supposed to be half. So they're not quite at that yet because right now it's only 42% of women who are in parliament, but the goal is to have it be half. Any other questions? Professor Horney? I know, David first. Well, I, uh, on the quota, is there a quota for the bureaucracy as well, or just for parliament? It's just for parliament, I, I believe. That's something, so with my thesis, I'm specifically going to start looking more into the gender quota and the effect that that can have. Because um, a lot of political scientists have just done studies on this, and they've concluded that the gender quota is the most effective way to have women be represented in government. And more specifically, this is something I can't speak a ton to right now, but hopefully in the near future once I've done more research. Um, so South Africa, South Africa's electoral system is different than the United States. They use proportional representation, um, whereas the United States has a first past the post system. And so South Africa's electoral system is better, it's, it's set up better to include more minority voices, um, including women's. So South Africa, um, I don't, I'm not sure about the institution, like, or the, more the bureaucracy and like small government. I'm not totally sure how the gender quota applies there. Um, but right now, they have a very effective way of getting at least the gender, the gender quota in parliament. Professor Horney, do you have no. Michael. Uh, I know in some Scandinavian or Nordic countries, um, they also have quotas, but those quotas also branch into civil society or the private sector mm -hmm. on boards. Um, mm -hmm. So private companies are mandated by the government to have gender equality um, mm -hmm. at the highest level. Uh, is that an idea that's been entertained in South Africa or has an attraction, or is, is it really kind of at this point just still sector only to parliamentary representation? Yeah, and that's a good question. I think right now it really is just contained more in the government from the research I've done at least but that's something that I want to research more for my thesis to see how effective it would be if it bleeds over into the private sector as well. So that's an example of, I mean, that's gonna come from the public sector first, like the lawmakers would have to pass an act or a law making it so that gender quotas are you know, enforced on private boards. 
but uh, it sounds like there's a force with us. <laughs> but yeah, just one more question. Professor Horning, do you still have your question? I have plenty of opportunity to ask, so. Yeah, I have to thank Professor Horning also because she is my thesis advisor. So she has been guiding me.